Kia ora, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathan Burke. I'm with New Zealand Link Care Trust. I have Tony in the background, so I'm monitoring the, the chats and everything and, and um, assisting me. Uh, Tony is the Wetlands is Farm As Asset Coordinator um, down in North Canterbury. I'm the Hawke's Bay Regional Council Coordinator in Hawke's Bay, but um, I do a lot of work throughout the, the country. So as we're waiting for people to come on, if you go in the chat um, and introduce yourself and where you're from, we appreciate that. So we know people know um, who's on board and, and uh, where they're from. So we get a little bit of idea of, of of what areas people are actually in and we'll get here moving in, in a minute Awesome, so Central Hawks Bay people, some Marlboro people, Manawatu. All right, we'll just get started and as people come on, they'll get on. As I said, my name is Nathan, um, New Zealand Lake Care Trust Coordinator and uh, up here in Hawks Bay. Um, I've got 35 years of experience working in wetlands and streams and restoration and that kind of thing. Um, a lot of it was working with waterfowl, uh, but also some endangered species, threatened species recovery and that kind of thing. So uh, just give, that's a little bit of my background. I've been working for the trust for the past five years as the coordinator and working with a lot of the farmers. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about farm dams and, and um, how will they play a role in, in, in New Zealand biodiversity? We'll have a little bit of discussion around how to improve your farm dance, uh, dam for biodiversity. And then we'll go into some case studies and show you what has been done and, and a couple of um, farm dams that we'll just show you what's, what can be done on those dams and then go through that. We'll not talk about pest control. That's a whole different subject. We're basically talking about enhancing it and, and little things you can do to enhance it, including planting and that kind of thing. Uh, it's very broad because we've got people from around the country. So when it comes down to planting plans and that kind of thing, I won't um, go into too many plant details just because uh, the, the plants vary from region to region. And we'll, we'll have a little bit of talk about that as we go. I'll just just real quick, uh, this picture here, just to, to show you, this is an old farm pond in Shakespeare Park in Auckland that uh, they've basically revegetated and restored and, and creating into a native bush area. But that's a really neat area that shows you what a, a, a farm pond could actually look like enhanced for biodiversity. So what are farm dams? Uh, basically, they're, they're small artificial lakes. Uh, usually they have a lot of deep permanent water. They do fluctuate um, throughout the seasons, especially Hawke's Bay, the, the east coast of, of the South Island and, and uh, those drier areas. But they, they basically are, are basically small lakes and they do have a small shallow margin. So when we looking at biodiversity, we're looking at basically what, what does the lake do to answer, uh, do to um, have for biodiversity and how we do that. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through the presentation, please put them in the chat and then I will answer those at the end. Tony is keeping a tr track of all those questions and we'll, we'll go through them at the end. Farm dams are generally were put in basically for stock water uh, or sometimes irrigation and sometimes on, on farms and, and small blocks to help water your garden. Some ponds are, or dams are put in for, for water for protection, especially the drier areas, Nelson, Marlboro, Hawks Bay. It's a source for water to fighting fire. Uh, some farm dams are put in for wildlife habitat, and that's really where we're focused today. Uh, they, they can increase the productivity and the property values, their attractive features, and there's some recreation on them. Duck hunters use them. There's some 
eeling and and catching a tuna on them you know um and then s some are used for swimming when we're thinking about our farm ponds and and what we want to do to enhance from biodiversity we actually got to consider where that farm pond sits in into the um scheme of things we got to consider where it sits in the catchment um on the property and what what are your overall goals if you want biodiversity you can't just plant one of your farm ponds up and expect um really have high biodiversity you got to look in and say hey because for a lot of of um water birds we're looking at you need wetlands and, and ponds in in a um across the landscape and in a fairly good number so they can move from one to the next next and and vary sizes and that kind of thing and also as you guys are developing a lot of farmers are developing their their farm plans it should be part of your farm plan we got these ponds or these dams we want to fence them off what are we going to do with them instead of just fencing them off and leaving them we want to actually enhance them they can be fried stepping habitat for a lot of terrestrial birds from native bush patches to other native bush patches there's a lot of, of reasons that we want to enhance the biodiversity of these dams just recently there's been a study on of farm pond succession and, and basically farm ponds start out you 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 create it put a dam in and the first few years you get this nice farm dam with not a lot around it and then as time goes, it gets a little bit smaller, the sediment comes in and it dries out. And over 50 years, you end up with a little marshy area. But the idea of, is for biodiversity, we wanna, we wanna stop this, this um, succession from somewhere around C and, and, and D, somewhere in between there, where we get a lot of, of reeds on the side and a little bit of wa open water and and hold it um if we the succession can be slowed down to even stopped if it's fenced and protected from livestock so first off farm dams why do we fence them well for the first part is is basically by fencing them and reticulating water or taking stock pond or pond water and and sending it to a trough and protecting that water increases your farm productivity and it, it's cleaner water for your your animals so better health and better best uh, better weight gains and and that kind of thing so actually in the long run it does pay off to fence off those farm ponds and 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 to to enhance them uh recent studies have actually showed that most farm ponds produce four times the amount of greenhouse gases than any freshwater system and part of that is because of the nutrients coming in from the landscapes or because they're mostly in agricultural areas. Uh, most farm ponds, a lot of times have a high nutrient level of, of nitrogen phosphorus. And those ponds are cycling that and, and reducing uh, meth or releasing methane, methane. And what we found, so what the research has found is basically by fencing off those farm ponds and those farm dams and enhancing them, you can get those gas, those greenhouse gas emissions down to basically what a fresh other freshwater system is. So there's just another positive to it that um, with all this global climate change and everything going on, it's just an easy way to to reduce our impact on on greenhouse gases. And of course, what we're all here tonight about is talking about biodiversity, increasing biodiversity. Um, there's we've lost ninety percent of our wetlands ponds will never and these dams will never replace the wetlands we lost but they can act as a surrogate for a lot of it and provide habitat for a lot of birds that use water birds that use these areas so when we talk about fencing it's it's really you know it's a trade-off you know we you you a farmer wants you want to maximize your grazing area but you want to protect your pond and but the more of a buffer you give around the pond the better biodiversity values you get so each pond's going to vary and that kind of thing and you just got to weigh those onto it um at least a, a, a 15 meter buffer is, is actually at least you'll at a 15 meter buffer you'll start getting some biodiversity values 
And of course, the larger the buffer around the pond, you know, the, the more biodiversity values get. Also, by putting that buffer in, especially on the uphill side, we we reduce those nutrients going into the ponds and the sediments going into the ponds. So the ponds last longer and uh, provide more value for us and cleaner water. So when we're talking about biodiversity, we talk about our water birds and we've got a whole lot of these so the little dab chicks um, here in Hawks Bay. They're relatively uncommon, but a lot of farm ponds have them. They, they feed on aquatic invertebrates and are, are actually quite nice to have. They require fairly deep water. You've got coots. We've got waders that use that will use ponds in, in the shallows. You've got your spoonbills, your your herons, and 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 sometimes uh, um, for foraging, we we find that bittern will use some of the edges of the farm ponds. And there's also waterfowl values, um, which a lot of farmers do because a lot of water farmers, uh, a lot of farmers are waterfowl hunters, and they shoot on these ponds, but. Um, we're finding that actually some of the farm ponds are actually good for some of our threatened birds like the brown teal. And the deeper water habitats on ponds provide habitat for scalp and, and that kind of thing, but they get used by all kinds of, of waterfowl and water, water birds. Don't always think about native fish and in farm ponds, but actually uh, Southland Fish Game did a study just a few years ago, and I think some of them are on board right now. Um, but they're, they're looking at the these ponds that were actually developed for waterfowl hunting, and, and um, if they were creating refuge for um, tuna and eels, and um, found that they actually were. But when they were doing the study, they found that some of our galaxids were using these farm ponds too. So they provide habitat for some very threatened um, fish species. And of course, aquatic invertebrates are probably the start of everything. If you want all your other waterfowl and, and water birds and that kind of thing, you actually need to create um, habitat for these aquatic species. And some of our aquatic species that use farm ponds are rare or uncommon, but we've got, you know, boatmen and, and damselflies and dragonflies. And the nice thing though is if you create habitat for damselflies and dragonflies and, and you, get population up, it takes care of your mosquito population. So you, you can go enjoy your pond without really worrying about mosquitoes because you got these natural um, killers of mosquitoes living in your pond. Other aquatic species, and there's a really good, um, there's some potential economic potential for this, but you know, core are, 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 are really good for um, good aquatic biodiversity for our ponds. and. There is a little bit of a core market, and some of the, the farm ponds or some of the ponds in forestry are, are farming core. So there's a potential there for farmers if they want to start farming core um, to enhance their ponds for biodiversity, but also get a little bit of um, profit off of them too. There's a lot of work you could go through MPI and that kind of thing to do it, but there is that opportunity there. And of course, I didn't talk about. Um, the terrestrial birds, but of course, by planting around those ponds and, and putting trees and stuff there, you attract terrestrial birds and you create a habitat that moves, uh, that allows these terrestrial birds like Tui and that kind of thing to move across the landscape. So when we are managing our, our farm ponds and or dams for biodiversity, uh, most of the times, if they've been exposed to sock, the edges are, are steep and, and there's not a lot of, of um, not a lot of slope to it. So we want generally when we're looking for it, we want generally sloping shorelines, not a shoreline that basically you could walk into and you don't have to step down into is that's so I always what my um my rule of thumb is if I can just slope and just walk down into the pond and then, then my edges slope just right. Uh, plant native grasses and sedges around a, and create a buffer strip. Logs, trees, and shrubs, and provide habitat for wildlife. I'll talk about logs and trees and logs in the few, in the um in the next couple of slides, but both in the water and around the pond, outside the water, because those logs are breaking down and create food for um, invertebrates and and nesting habitat for some of our ducks, like um, gray teal will will nest under some logs and that kind of thing. Okay, 
um, fencing off cattle. And then, you know, again, installing a, low, a pump system if, if you don't have a reticulate system or to, to use um, to reticulate your pond, your dam water into for livestock. So creating shallow water habitat, basically, uh, uh, if you're going to, uh, you could fence off your pond or your dam and plant it and it probably have fire, biodiversity values, but to really just get that above to where it's really good, it some usually will require a little bit of work and bringing in uh, some digger work. Um, so um, what I do is, is I, I try to go in if we can't room we create shallow water habitat by shallow water habitat i'm looking at something that's basically under 300 mils basically gumboot deep that allows for emergent vegetation to grow it's where most of our bugs are and it's where um, most of the ducks forage when we're looking at, at waterfowl and water birds foraging it's that three to four or five hundred mils um, where they do most of their foraging deep water habitat doesn't provide much for that so we, we go and we create shallow water habitat. Again, re-sloping the edges. So you, you, you walk in there. So animals, waterfowl and water birds can walk in and out and they don't have to jump up onto steep slopes or anything like that. And it provides that, that movement out and through. And the inclusion of wood. And this is the one thing that I really am, am a big fan of. I've The first thing I've done in a lot of ponds is I'll put some logs in, some trees in, and uh, what we found basically is, is you want about two cubic meters of wood minimum per hectare, and what it, that provides a carbon source that allows for your recycle, uh, denitrification of, um, nutrient, of nitrogen, provides a loafing habitat for water birds, but um, it also provides places for your aquatic invertebrates to live and go. A lot of times I like doing um, putting a tree in where the, the root is out on the shoreline and the top of the tree is in there with all the branches and stuff. And that provides really good habitat, especially for um, the, the tuna and eels and also for a lot of our water birds. So I, if I can get as much wood in there as possible without making it look too much, um, it is, it's, I try to do that. Again, it adds that carbon source and it goes eventually when you get trees growing and in a few years, you'll have some that actually branches will fall in and create that habitat and stuff. It's just jump starting some processes that would naturally occur in a lake or a wetland system. My favorite subject, um, islands. Everybody loves an island. They, every, everybody who wants to do um, biodiversity or, or put a, a, a pond in for waterfowl, they put islands in. It's, it's just, but the, my biggest question is, do we need them? Generally, when we're looking at most water birds and water bird nesting, you want an island for every hectare of, of, of water, um, or two hectares, sorry. But um, you got to really weigh it out. Um, the problem with I see with islands is that you create these islands. It's hard to manage pest control on them because you got to boat out and put um, put bait out or traps out to deal with rats and that kind of thing. It, it makes it a little bit of a challenge. Most ponds don't need islands. And then what, my other question for you is, is actually what makes an island? You know, um, you get you could have a whole lot of small little islands and we'll go through and I'll show you some of the few little tufts of grass, some logs that are going in that allow ducks to get up on and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of islands. Everybody who puts islands in, big islands in, usually put one in and I can tell a man-made wetlands and, and ponds just by seeing that they only have one wetland, one big island on where you might get better benefits by having multiple islands. Okay, well, we look at, when I look at, at lakes and wetlands and, and, and you look at the bottom of those, you know, you, you have this layer of, of organic matter and in that layer of organic matter, there's invertebrates and all kinds of things going on. And when you go to a, a, a dam, a lot of times there's not that layer of organic matter. So generally, if you want to increase productivity by adding organic matter into that, um, that dam will actually increase that invertebrates. It also creates 
nutrients is this breaking down for your emergent plants and that kind of thing. So again, it's just jump starting because that at, once you get emergent plants growing in there, they'll start creating that organic matter for for bugs and stuff. But it's just it's just jump starting that. So a lot of times in a, on a newly constructed pond, we'll put a little bit of of so, topsoil in. But if we can't get topsoil in, I just um, tell the local the farmer I'm working with, hey, you can get, grab some old um, hay bales or straw bales, stick them in the water, let them soak in, then cut the strings off, just get a good layer of, of uh, organic matter. And you don't have to cover the whole pond. Basically, the shallow areas where, you, where most of your bugs are um, is, is what you're looking for. Um, th this is... Um, this is my little bit of a, a bugbear, and I'll, I'll get. I'll just go on my soapbox. A lot of land management advisors will tell you that farm ponds make great sediment traps, and yes, they do. But if we use farm ponds as sediment traps, um, we, as as we're finding out, is that that increases the nutrient levels in those farm ponds, and it's increasing the amount of greenhouse gases it's, re it's releasing. So the first thing you do uh, to me is, is if I can put a sediment trap in before the pond to, to drop that sediment out um, before it goes in the pond, that's the best is, is probably the best case scenario. Second um, is if you don't have a sediment trap, just have a really good buffer where your water's coming in of, of native grasses or sedges that, that slow that water down, let sediment drop out. So it keeps the sediment from moving into your into your dam and it increases the length of your dam. If you got a lot of sediment coming down, there might be some land management issues in, that you're dealing with. So um, you got to look at your land management issues in, in those. But um, don't I, I, I just, uh, I'd argue don't treat your, your dam as a as a sediment trap. We want biodiversity. We, we don't want nutrients in it. And if you're using that, that water for uh, for water, drinking water, you don't want those nutrients in there anyways. So I do all those little things and just it, it adds that value and it adds more biodiversity by adding those little things. And then we go into planting. And I'm going to be really general here when we talk about planting because it, it, it's, it's, I can't get into the species because species vary. Some of them do. Your best thing to do is it, when you want to plant around your dam and stuff, either talk to your local um, council and they usually have a wetland planning guide and those wetland planning guides are probably pretty good for using around your farm ponds and even just talk to your local nurseries that are selling native plants and, and have a chat with them. Um, we're going to break these planting zones in, into basically f five different areas. You got your dam wall and your spillway and your dam wall, um, then you got your buffer and that's and then your dam edge and the dam edge is is a lot of times it's, it's a broad edge it's it's it can be fairly broad it's where your water um goes up and down to you got your shallow water habitat and you got your deep water habitat so dam walls and spillways long term um you don't want any woody vegetation on your dam wall um, the problem with woody vegetation is it, it's got they get big roots and that causes tunneling and, and, and impacts your dam wall. So a lot of farmers will fence everything off and leave the dam wall unfenced and graze that. Um, if you fence the dam wall, you can still keep it in your pasture grasses and, and have it fenced just in pasture grasses and just control grazing it every two to three years. Um, most of our pasture grasses are imported from the Northern Hemisphere, are evolved around grazing. And if you just left it lay um, without any grazing, uh, it'll basically choke itself out and get stagnant and you'll end up with bare ground and that kind of thing. So if you do leave it in, in, in pasture grass, I'd say just have a, a management around to control grazing, um, put a, a flock of sheep in there every two or three months just to keep the, the grass from from dying or, or actually you probably get away with once every two to three years uh, grazing it and still keep healthy grass. It'll, it takes a little bit depending upon the grass species. The other side of things is is you could plant it with native grasses or sedges. A toy toy um, 
uh, and in some areas, if you got tussock grasses, especially the higher uh, farm dams um, would be really great. And while I look at dam walls, if we can get it in, in some of your, your sedge species, um, giant umbrella sedge and some of your sedge species that handle dry soil really well are great. And what happens, um, and it's probably flaxes, but don't plant too heavily in flaxes, but by having it either in grasses and or these native sedges and stuff, you basically have nesting habitat for all your ground nesting species, your waterfowl and that kind of thing. So you, your dam wall becomes really important. Uh, just remember, um, you just got to maintain it. Even when you plant in native sedges and grasses, you just keep an eye um, and make sure that nothing, no woody vegetation grows up onto it. If it does, just remove it um, quick and easy. The buffer. So that's between the edge and the your, your fence. Okay. Um, it all depends upon your management, but yeah, um, it's dry. And the, the, the thing about ponds is, is like wetlands have this, this, this gradual edge from wet to dry where ponds are just like wet and then dry. So when we're looking at the upland habitat, you're basically planting it and if in natives, um, and if you're playing it natives, you're looking at dry habitat um, species. My recommendation when you're playing those dam buffers is to go look at the Bees for Trees or Trees for Bees uh, website. They have a really good planting guide for every region on, on trees that are really good for pollinators, which will actually help with your paddock production. Um, so that, that goes in. Have a chocolate chat with your council. They usually have some um, pamphlets on what trees to plant. Generally, you want to plant your higher trees on the windward side to protect uh, your your pond from wind and that helps with waterfowl that helps with our water birds or our dragonflies and damselflies are very sensitive to wind so um, by breaking that wind off across the pond that that really helps with the aquatic invertebrates too and if you're planting that upper area pretty high um, in, in native vegetation and, and pretty thickly in about five to seven years after you, you do your initial planting, you're going to go back and, and plant the understory species, ferns and um, and, and uh, kawa kawa and that kind of thing. So, so you don't end up with bare ground underneath. If you plant it with, with native ferns and that kind of thing, you also create that nesting habitat in that forest area for your ground nesting birds. But all these photos I have are of, of um, are of, of man-made ponds. This one here is a actually a stormwater pond in, in Hamilton, but I think it's really good because they show you a, a really nice planted um, buffer. And so your dam edge and, and your edges is that shallow water habitat. And um, well, it's not the shallow water habitat, it's that wet edge where the water and the ground meet. And, and um, Generally, you want to plant those in native sedges, flaxes that provide a little bit of overhead cover that hang over the, the shallow water that allow escape cover for waterfowl and, and that kind of thing. Uh, also, it, those sedges prevent a lot of weeds from, from establishing water weeds establishing. I generally try to leave a, just a vegetative edge and then plant my native trees up and above, but a lot of times you can plant some of your, your shrubby caprosmas um, and that kind of thing right along the edge, especially some of them that provide um, berries. There's uh, you know, um, caprosma propinqua, and I don't know the distribution on the south island of that, but um, it produces a berry that the waterfowl eat. And if I do plant shrubs right next to the water's edge, I usually plant them in clumps um, to provide, also provide a little bit of overhead cover. And then the shallow water habitat, and it all depends upon each, each farm dam, how much shallow water you ha habitat you have. But if you go and look at a natural lake, you can, it has rings around it and, it, and you can see um, the vegetation change in different rings as, as the water gets deeper towards the middle. And, and these are these, what, what we call reed beds. And um, those beds create escape habitat for water birds, nesting habitat for like our, our grebes and our dab chicks and some of the waterfowl species will, will nest in those reed beds and really good provides for the aquatic invertebrates, which are food items for a lot of our wading birds and water birds. Generally, when we're planting these, you just want to get them, you just want to get those started. Um, sedges 
work really well. Um, rushes, Ralpo, again, go look at your wetland planting guides that your region has and get those. I tell people don't plant it really thickly because they can, they will grow, grow fast. So I just get clumps and I'll plant them around the dam and just allow them naturally to create their own reed bed. It's, it's unless you have the, the money to do it, um, within a few years, a lot of, the, of especially the, the rushes and um, we'll, we'll go around. I'll have a little bit of a, a little bit of a spiel about Ralpo right now. People love and hate Ralpo. Um, it can take over a pond, especially if, if this, the, the water has a high nutrient level. Um, but it's, it's really important habitat for a lot of our water birds and especially our waterfowl species that, um, that, uh, that molt. They, they, our waterfowl species tend to molt in Ralpo because it provides cover and, and waterfowl will do a full molt where they can't fly for um, several weeks. So it's, it's incredibly important, um, but you wouldn't want it in smaller ponds um, because it, it does take over. You can't generally, most places don't um, actually provide Ralpo for you. You can't buy it usually at, um, at um, your nurseries, but it's, it's easy to transplant. Again, the reed beds uh, the, are really great um, because they are the ones that are going to be actually using a lot of the nutrients that have come down into your water. So they help keep your water clean um, and they provide that, that um, filtering. And, and again, you know, it's great for, for waterfowl and game birds and also the, our, our aquatic vertebrates. So, you know, I think that this is the, the biggest thing to do um, after your fence is to make sure you get a reed bed established. And then on the other thing is it also protects um, erosion on your banks um, you know, from wind, from waves, and especially your dam wall. If you got a nice row of reed beds in front of that dam wall, it prevents that dam wall from eroding and, and, and increases longevity of it. And when you have eroding banks, you end up with, with mucky water, which doesn't help, um, which reduces your aquatic invertebrates, which almost all your water birds are dependent upon. Um, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on reed beds um, and because I think they're incredibly important. Most soil types, they're easy to, to, um, to maintain. And most reed beds and, and most of our, our rushes and um, balmias and that kind of thing, um, can handle the wet dry. So if you're in, in an area where your ponds dry out, most of them can handle it. They'll spread, natu they'll spread naturally. Uh, sometimes the water birds will bring them in anyways and, and they'll establish if there's not a lot of wave action. Um, but once they're established, they actually can grow pretty quickly. So um, again, don't spend a lot of money in establishing your reed, but get a, a clumps established around your pond, depending upon your pond size and just let it naturally go over in a couple of years, it'll be through. And here's the importance to me of a reed bed. It provides all that cover for our water birds. Um, and especially if we're dealing with, with threatened species like brown teal, which are starting to use a lot of our farm ponds. It provides that escape cover from harriers and, and um, predators. And also is, is a variety of, 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 of food of aquatic invertebrates that use these, these reed beds which provide that high protein for a lot of water birds. Again, you know, we're looking at the rushes as kind of practice, you, you know, balmias, which are um, your sedges, your, your junkus rushes. Uh, just go and, and have a chat with, or, or look at your, your wetland planting guide. Some of these plants won't be able, your nurseries won't provide. Um, I recommend that if, if, you, if they don't, you just go look at somebody who's already fenced off a farm. They might actually have some and just dig some up and transplant. When you do that though, make sure you, 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 you aren't taking any invasive weeds with you um, when you transplant the, those. So um, it's just something to be careful and know what um, you're, you're taking from one to the next. So it might require a little bit of, of chatting with, with some experts in your area. Uh, the other thing you can use is iNaturalist, um, which you can take a picture 
of the plant that you're looking at to identify and somebody and people will identify it for you so you know exactly what you, you have. But yeah, just make sure if you're transplanting plants that you don't move unwanted plants to your, your pond. And sometimes on big waterways, um, yeah, this is thanks to the guys down south on Fish and Game for providing these photographs for me. Um, on big waterways where you got wave action, you might need to do something to protect your plantings till they established. And so what, what the guys at Southland did, they just put a bunch of straw bales, hay bales down and planted their sedges. And by the time those bales disintegrated, the sedges grew up enough that they were providing that protection around, around the edge and, and stopping that erosion. Real simple and easy to do. All right, we'll go into some case studies really quickly. Uh, this is uh, Central Hawks Bay, uh, actually it just down out of Hastings here. Um, I'll just show you, we, re, we went through and we re-sloped everything, created shallow water habitat. The other thing is um, in wetlands if for biodiversity, you want a good edge to water ratio. So we created these shallow bays and um, we had two more small ponds. We put a couple sediment ponds in because we actually had streams flowing into this and these sediment ponds actually act uh, protect this bigger pond. Um, that island was in there already, but you can see we've put some logs in there. We have a little, another little island there, some more logs for the waterfowl to get up into, but also probably that carbon. This was a nice little shallow pond and then that bottom one was actually shallow pond and, and those shallow ponds were, um, will eventually get it all covered with emergent vegetation and provides really good habitat for broods where around this island is fairly deep. So um, we're, we're trying to get a lot of, this was set up by water for waterfowl um, production. Um, this, this whole um, project was, was funded by the Game Bird Habitat Trust. I'll just put that out for those guys that are about the only ones that allow, that actually fund some work on farm ponds. Here's a small one up in Wairoa, and, and this was my plan for the guy. I already planted some, some rushes around the edges to get things going. And we sat down and, and sat and had a chat with him. He has it already fenced off. And so we're going to plant some comprosma robusta, some shrubby comprosmas here to provide a little bit of overhead cover. And, um, and uh, I was, we're going to plant some the edges around again with like some of the native sedges like carrick secta or, or giant umbrella sedge and then there was a seep here so he's going to plant a whole lot of native trees in here to create a little bit of native tree habitat um uh this is the, the jack bissett's um wetlands uh, in northland i just wanted to show you what they did here uh, they just opened up a little bit of area for for the livestock to get into the pond or the dam to, to feed or to drink and, and get out. Um, it works really well. Um, unfortunately, the best thing to do when you do something like this is this should be a little bit narrower and you should have this reinforced with, with, with metal or something like that. So, so when the stock are in there drinking, they're not stirring up mud. Uh, again, they've planted up. You can see they've planted up and they got these reed beds established. And it's quite interesting. You see that actually the reed beds are establishing really well in the areas that aren't grazed, um, which is really cool. Shakespeare Park, which is a um, nice little uh, predator-free park in Auckland. This is a, a old farm pond because this was an old farm. And I just really thought this was like the best example um, of, of a farm pond that um, that that would be is an ideal situation. The only thing that I don't you don't see a lot of is woody vegetation, but you got all this these rushes in through here, and uh, a nice buffer of, of trees, flaxes, and it's just alive with waterfowl, of course, and, and water birds. Um, and then you, this foreground has has a lot of native vegetation too, and this this all this foreground provides nesting cover for water birds. And and um, including bittern in here, and then you have this this deeper water habitat, which provides loafing habitat for a lot of waterfowl. This is a, a wetland that I worked in just last, or a pond that I worked in just last year. It was 
covering three properties. Gamebird Habitat Trust allowed us to go, uh, funded us to go in and do some enhancement, spraying out the next row of willows through here and re re replacing the dam wall. And we replaced the dam wall, but this is great because it's, it's, we've got all this woody vegetation from the willows that we sprayed out. Um, a, a good Ralpo bed here which actually has fern birds in, which is a, a, a threatened species. Uh, and then we've got some nice shallow water habitat through here. It goes up the arm um, with some deep water habitat through there. But um, after we sprayed these wells out, we're getting a little bit more open water. This is, we tend to shoot, you know, when, when I'm doing wetlands for water birds, uh, most water birds are looking at 50% open water, 50% in emergent vegetation. And we're just a little bit over in emergent vegetation here. Um, so, um, but it's still a fairly productive pond. A nice little pond in, in Central Hawks Bay. I'd like to show, I just wanted to show nice edge of, 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 of sedges here. A good um, rampo bed here, some open water, and we got some hebes growing in here. The only thing that I thought this was missing is a couple logs or something, because there's not a lot of places for water birds like bittern or or herons to to sit on and forage on, or waterfowl to get out of the water. Um, there wasn't a lot of space for it, and that just put adding that woody vegetation here would just enhance that farm pond. Oh, sorry about that. Nardine um, says, yeah, well, um, yeah, when you're moving um, plants from one water, from one pond to the next, you know, um, especially up here in, in the North Islands, um, you got to be considered, um, you, you don't move um, eggs for pest fish. Uh, and one way to deal with that is, is if you take your, your rushes out of, um, out of, out of one pond, I, I usually grow them in a, in a, a fish bin in my house. And usually, um, if you grow them for a summer in your fish bin, you won't; those eggs won't be will will have died out. Northland again. Uh, this is a pond that I was working with. It, it actually has a nice little cacatea forest right here in the background, and um, it was completely covered with willows. And we went in and cut out those willows. But under those willows were these nice little um, carexectas growing on the bases of willows, and we we cut the willows out. And, and paste them with a, with a uh, cut and paste herbicide. And as soon as we did that, the, these sedges really bloomed and, and grew. They were really straggling and created a lot of areas. And what we found is it's fairly shallow and it's basically knee deep and it got a lot of waterfowl use. And then we ended up planting this, the, the buffer on this side with, with sedges and, um, and flaxes. Uh, this nice little stormwater pond, but I wanted to show you, we got these nice little, um, we've got these carexectas out here and they create really good cover um, and instant cover. The, these things you can establish pretty quickly and, and waterfowl just move in and out from under these whenever harriers and that kind of thing move through. Again, the only one, this one's really missing. Um, it's fairly deep water habitat, but um, it doesn't have a lot of shallow water habitat, but if there was a couple of logs or trees in here, it would just be really good from a biodiversity standpoint. Nice little pond on the Hertonga Plains here in Hawke's Bay. Nice Ralpo edge. Um, actually, this Ralpo covers about uh, uh, three quarters of the pond, but it's fairly open in the Ralpo and, and the waterfowl just move in and out of this. Um, there's, a little, there's a drain right next to this, but it, it's a really abundant, again, um, we, this has been, mode because um, fish and game were, were trapping ducks here at the time. But um, you can see we've got some nice edges. The sedges are on the edges creating some, some habitat. And then um, this is um, a poplar edge for the, that was actually planted to protect the, the, the drain. This is a picture a guy sent me years ago and I can't remember the guy. He's probably on this thing, um, on this today, um, but um, of, of a Southland pond that, that he that he built for waterfowl and he sent to me. And, and it's a nice little pond, nice shallow water. Again, this one, uh, we need some woody vegetation in there and actually creating some reed beds and some, some and it's nice shallow already crossed, but establishing reed beds, he's got this nice buffer of sedges that goes back a good ways and provides that nesting habitat. This is a really good for bittern. Um, if, if we get some 
emergent vegetations from um, rushes and jun uh, and juncus in there, um, and and great for waterfowl. So it, it, it has potential, and and sometimes there's, a lot of times those will go in. The only thing I didn't talk about is is deeper water habitat and planting those those submerged vegetation. And it's basically, you don't have to do that. Waterfowl and water birds bring those things in over time once they start establishing or once they start moving into a pond. And last but not least, just running back a few years ago, um, I was talking to a farmer and, and they wanted to establish these, these nice carrot sector in, the, in their ponds. But a lot of times when I do, if we're, if I go in with a digger, we just create a little bit of a mound and plant a plant on there. And, and but sometimes we don't have the digger to do it. So I, I, I started using straw bales. And basically, um, I put straw bales in and planted a, a, a secta in the straw bales. And within a couple months, um, within six months, we've had the, the, the carrot secta established. We had a little bit of issues with the straw bales. Um, pea straw didn't work for us, um, but lucerne straw worked. And, but um, and, but we haven't been able to. I haven't been able to trial anything else besides those two. Um, but it also help. You, you can also establish reed beds in that in that kind of, of situation. Um, but you, you automatically this 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 pond went from really no cover to all of a sudden a whole bunch of cover. And unfortunately. You can see the stakes where the pea straw was. It been it looked a whole lot nicer if those would have worked. But um, it was a quick and easy way. It ended up costing us twenty dollars um, per for the bale, a stake, and and the two and the two sedge um, root trainers and the sedges. Uh, it's really it was a pain in the butt to get the, the the root trainers in there. But what I found is I took a pair of, of hedge hedging clippers and just stuck it in and turned it and pulled it and it allowed me an opening that I could stick um, plants in. Just don't make sure you put your finger in where the hedge clippers are, you might lose your finger. Just to show you what would happen a year after this, this pond dried out because um, in a drought year, but we can see that the roots have really established and started making that nice little stem and, and it's sustainable. And this was, this was what it looked like a year later. So, um, it was a quick and simple way of creating that habitat and that shallow water and creating um, areas for water birds to escape from. And also the, the, these plants help remove the, those nutrients. And that was, that's the end of my presentation. And I'll bring Tony on here real quick and, and we can, um, if anybody has questions, please put them on the, in the thing and we'll just go through um, and have a bit of a chat. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, Nathan. I um, always enjoy hearing about your experiences with farm dams and ponds and, and biodiversity. Great reminder about the, the wood and the water, particularly that carbon from a carbon perspective and, and the habitat. Um, and some great ideas there along with the straw um, or hay to increase organic matter as well. Um, I thought it was a really good reminder also about um, trees for bees when we're considering um, buffers. Um, I heard you respond to Nadine's comment um, that pest eggs or, or fish could be brought into your pond inadvertently by moving vegetation around. Um, just sort of thinking farm dams and farm pond biodiversity perspective, what's some of the other mistakes you see people make? Um, it, it, it's not mistakes. It's just it's, um, sometimes we just go in and, and, and we they fence it and they, they plant it and, and, um, and it's good. And it, it does work when you do that. But again, it's about those little things, adding, adding a little bit of wood, um, creating that shallow water habitat um, and that kind of thing. The biggest mistake people do is they plant trees on the, on the dam wall. And, and, um, and then they have a dam fail, or the wall fails and, and causes problems and they got to go back and fix it. Um, yeah. And that's, that's the biggest thing that, that people, um, people do around dams. Um, okay. pest, pest fish is always, a, it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, I didn't talk about it, but um, I should have. I, um, if, if, you, if you do have a farm pond with water flowing through, you want to make sure you have fish passage. So if, if, you, um, if, if your pond's going through a culvert or something like that, make sure that you have a fish passage around that. And that's, that's a whole different conversation. But um, if you have fish passage, then, then those ponds actually increase that biodiversity um, for a lot of your, your things. Uh, the other thing that um, 
everybody asks me, and it's the most common question, Tony, is is, is willow. Um, everybody likes putting um, a weeping willow um, on their farm pond. And uh, I'm, I'm not against weeping willows, um, but we're, we're talking about biodiversity. Really, they don't provide a lot of, of, of um, a lot for biodiversity. Um, but the other problem with weeping willows, especially if you got a pond that's not fed, is, is basically rain fed. Um, they just suck a whole lot of water out of your farm pond. So you, you, you lose water by planting something like that. Uh, duck hunters like planting them mainly because it provides that overhead cover for, for waterfowl. But basically, it takes years for that to come in where if you planted those carexectas up and, and established reed beds, you already have that cover. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I generally don't recommend willows, um, but there is opportunities around those farm ponds for, uh, for a little bit of farm forestry and, and planting um, some, some valued um, timber for future um, T timber and that kind of thing and mm -hmm. but when you do that you just got to consider where you're going to drop your tree and your fencing and all that kind of stuff so if you if you think oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna put this and i'm gonna put a few oak trees in here so i have some oak wood in a hundred years um yeah you got to think about all right how do i drop the how will i drop the tree in the futures and be able to mill it you know so if, if you're using your those areas those retired areas for farm forestry it's just something to to think about it's always good to think ahead that's for sure i'm just wondering you know from somebody say who was quite new at this whole idea of understanding the biodiversity in their in their pond or dam yep what, what's the best way to actually know sort of what, what you've got there i mean how do you how do you stock take without having the years of experience you might have what, what's the best way for somebody to understand what they've actually got already well it's just um <laughs> the best way to to, to manage um, anything is is to actually just just watch nature and and, and see what see what your pond does. Um, the environment DNA now that they have um, is getting a whole lot better, and I'm hoping that we can actually. I'd love to see. Um, so environment DNA is 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 we can take we can take samples of water and run it through a filter, and we can we can run DNA through it and tell you what's living in that waterway. And, and um, I, I've been having a chat with some of the people. Um, and fish and game and stuff like that and it's like love uh, the aussies have done it um they're way ahead of us when it, um, i hate to say that i'm probably getting um everybody's swearing at me right now but um the aussies are way ahead of us around that farm dam for biodiversity and they've been doing a lot of edna on those farm ponds and, and seeing what's living on those things before they even do work and then after they do work and they're finding that yeah it's just retiring um within a few years of retiring the, the biodiversity goes back up um, but you can take, like I said at the beginning, you could take and you could plant your farm dam up and you could get some biodiversity there, but it might not go up as high as you can. And then, but then when you go back and you look at it from landscape level, it's like, how is that farm pond connected to other ponds that are enhanced for biodiversity or wetlands that are enhanced for biodiversity? And, you know, from a water birch perspective, we're looking at, you know, 15 or so within a five kilometer um, area of 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 habitat for water birds is is probably what we're looking for ideal you know a lot of of, of duck shooters will, will do a, a up a farm pond they just like why aren't we shooting a lot of why aren't we seeing a lot of ducks and stuff but then you look around the area and there's not a lot of habitat around there and so um there's no linkage mm -hmm. So, you know, um, yeah, just sit there, look at what your, your, your dam has and, and what the potential is, um, you know, and, and the other thing is, is actually go around and, and talk to your neighbors, see what they have, what they've done. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and go through it, talk to, talk to fish and game, talk to the land care trust people and, and that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Kate has a question here about should we be concerned about introduced rushes and sedges and and yes, Kate, um, the, there are a few um, depending where you're at, um, and and that's some of them aren't going to be too much of an issue. Um, some of those the, the introduced sedges are are basically naturalized in the area anyways. Um, but if you're planting up, I would say you know go go natives and make sure you know what what you're planting. Um, and like I said, I, a lot of times I use iNaturalist if I don't can't recognize a, a sedge or a, um, or a or one of the rushes, and I'll take photographs of the seed heads and that kind of thing. And then 
um, an eye naturalist that goes into the cloud and, and uh, experts look at that thing, those over and will identify it for you. So it allows you to make sure you have at least a, some some good idea of what you, what you have and what you're planting. Um, and going from there, uh, some of the pond weeds um, can be pretty aggressive, but some of the pond leaves, like there's a what they call curly leaf pond leaf, which is Potobagetan something. I can't remember what it is. It's a non-native, but you'll find it almost in every pond. It's it's been naturalized in the area. It's actually um, lettuce to waterfowl, and so um, I, I wouldn't plant it in there. But it, it's it's m through most. Uh, I, I would say through all the North Islands. I don't know about the South Islands. A question you mentioned a couple of times about Rapo and its uh, potential to take over. Yep. Just wondering, I mean, first, how do you know if Rapo has got to a point where it's just sort of taken over? Um, and secondly, if that's the case, I mean, how, what, what sort of things can you do to reduce it or knock it back a wee bit? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's funny. Um, yeah. I'm, the nice thing about working in, in ponds for biodiversity, enhancing ponds for biodiversity is, is that, or farm dams, is that they're already established. There's no consenting process. So you can do a lot of work in there, which doesn't answer your question, but you can you can go in and do a lot of things that you wouldn't actually be able to do in a, in a wetland. So management options are a little bit bigger for those. Ralpo, um, yeah, it depends what your, um, what your, your, um, your long-term, ideas for you know waterfowl hunters don't like it because if it takes over the pond they drop a duck in there the dogs have a hard time finding it um and and a lot of times instead of ralpo i recommend like some of the bulbashanus which grow up and they die back every winter um but it's it just depends what it, really good ralpo is great because it creates um Waterfowl will nest in it. They'll the the dead stalks as they bound, they'll nest on top of the dead stalks as they they stack up. Uh, bittern use ralpo, so it creates habitat for bittern. Um, it's just one of those things. But and and like I said, waterfowl need it to molt. Um, or they generally molt in those. Um, so it, it does have its potential. Um, but people don't like seeing a pond that's just completely full with ralpo. And, and if it's if the pond's a hundred percent full of ralpo, then um, it's not it, the biodiversity values drop because Ralpo is aggressive. Usually, if it's full with Ralpo, there's some other issues. Um, there's a lot of sediment coming into the ponds. There's a lot of nutrients coming into the pond, and that feeds the Ralpo and, and moves it in and, and allows it to go over. So, you know, there might be some underlying issues that you need to, to, to think about when you look at Ralpo when it takes over. Um, mm, good point. Uh, so stand back and look at the bigger picture by the sounds of it. Yeah, yep, yep, and 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 what you want, but again, you know, like when um when we're looking at most water birds, you're looking, you want fifty percent in that what we call emergent vegetation, which is the vegetation that's growing out of the water, and fifty percent open water, and um you know so you know if if, if the rapo is taking over ninety percent of it, it just reduces that that value from a biodiversity standpoint. However, um. If you're in close to wetlands and stuff and you've got fern birds um, and you want to manage your, your pond for fern birds, um, they'll use that Ralpo pretty well. And if, you, if you're managing it for fern birds and on the farm at, on the dam edge, I'd be planting a lot of, of, of the shrubby um, diver, diverticating um, plants that, that fern birds like, but um, we, we do see ferns birds using some of the Rapo areas in the swamps. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, just sort of thought too, that if you're pumping water out of the ponds, you know, for stock water or, or whatever, um, what sort of things do you need to consider to sort of prevent your, um, your hard earned biodiversity being sucked up the, through the pump and, and away? Yeah, well, um, you, usually what, um, what I recommend with, with, with people with that want to use the pond still for stock waters is it goes to a one trough, you know, um, in, in, in a paddock or a couple troughs, which doesn't use that much water. The one thing you need to be concerned about, and um, it's really easy to do, is, is that your intake for your water um, to the trough, your intake should be um, below the surface of the water. Um, I can't tell you the, the exact depth, but about a half meter um, below the surface of the water. And because your surface water um, is where you would have E. coli and that kind of things. And the water's a little bit cooler and a little bit cleaner. Um, so um, 
back in the um, back in the day, the wildlife service guys had designed a a little floating one um, that that it was on a float and the, the intake was just sat underneath it. And as the water levels rose, it just came up and down. Um, that design is in a publication on um, on restoring wetlands um, by Doc way back um, 19, early 90s. Um, it's a really hard publication to find and I've lost my copy. I used to have a PDF copy of it and I've lost that. Um, I'm still trying to find a copy of it. It's a really good book, but um, yeah. Um, because you always want that intake underwater because a lot of times you're, you're, use, you're siphoning the water off. So um, you want to keep constant flow of water into, into there and just run it to a, a, um, a trough. If you run it to a tank, you know, just make sure that um, you keep, uh, actually um, it doesn't hurt um, if your pond goes dry because a lot of times, but when they dry out in late summer, you, your birds have moved on to other places, but by drying ponds out, you create habitat for a lot of um, species that are, that you, um, basically live in ephemeral wetlands that, that dry out regularly anyways. Um, um, so, you know, if you have a pond that dries out, it still can provide biodiversity through most of the year and, and actually might be fried habitat for um, some of the, um, some of the, like your tadpole shrimp, um, which, live in waterways, ephemeral wetlands that dry out every summer. Their seeds, their, their eggs just sit there until the next rain and they fill up and then they hatch and, and breed. And those, those little tadpole shrimp are actually really important for a lot of water birds, our bittern and our um, herons and egrets um, because they, they provide a, a lot of calcium during the breeding season, right? Pre-breeding season when birds are, have, are needing that calcium to make, lay eggs and stuff. So, um, you know, if your pond dries out in the summer and then what wets up, it's actually a good idea. It's a good place for tadpole shrimp. And I've been talking to Doc. Um, we've got a, a couple ponds here on, on a, a park here that we want to reintroduce tadpole shrimp in because those ponds dry out. And we thought, oh, this is great for educational purposes because um, it, there's no there's no access for native fish or anything like that. So it'd be a, just a perfect place to put those tadpole shrimp. Excellent, very good. Well, if there's any other questions, um, they're not coming through that can fast at the moment. So um, if it, what, what's your thoughts from here, Nathan? Will you have you got no, any well, other things you'd like to wrap up with or? Yep. I, I thanks everybody for for listening to me and 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 taking your evening out and, and listening. I hope it was informative. And like I said, you know, as 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 moving forward in this stuff, you know, um, we we don't have a lot of research around biodiversity and on on these these dams and and how to enhance them. And and I, a lot of times I I rely on on experts around the world to to provide us information. We're just really starting to hit it really um, really hard in, in New Zealand, but. Again, with with 90% loss of wetlands, um, they, these dams won't replace that loss of wetlands and won't and, and won't have the same values as them. But we can a lot of our threatened and endangered species can be and um, can be, their population can be enhanced by using these um, these farm dams and, and enhancing them. And it provides an asset that that makes enhances the farm. Thanks for thanks okay. for um. Yep, thanks for um, attending and um, hold on a second, I think there's, uh, yep, thanks for attending and uh, we'll see what we have with the next webinar and um, yep. Just a quick, quick, quick last question, Nathan, is this going to be available for people who were on the call or maybe those who weren't able to make it? Yep, this, this presentation will be on uh, the New Zealand Lake Care Trust YouTube sites uh, probably in the next couple of weeks. And anybody who attended this or, or registered and couldn't attend, um, we will send an email out when it's when it's put on, so you can do it, um, see it, and it will also go on to the Facebook site to let people know um, when it's on. And I see a couple of, of my old colleagues are on there, so um, it's good to see that they're around and kicking. So thanks everybody, and, and have a good night.